We built this film on a foundation of love. Its purpose? To shatter the mental barriers constructed from a lifetime of indoctrination. The eyes are useless when the mind is blind. We are participants in a prison system we are unable to see. Once the veil is lifted, there is no turning back. Many of us rarely realize we are the victims of indoctrination. We follow the pre-planned layout of life, living in a state of confusion, controlled by a small group of individuals who possess great wealth, estate, and control. They monetarily benefit by keeping us blind to the true nature of the shape of the earth. Most are too busy to question what they are told or investigate the scientific theory about the physical world and its shape, wrongly taught in schools as fact. Inquiries made on a controlled platform such as YouTube or Facebook are quickly rerouted to videos and content that hold no merit. Misconceptions occur either intentionally or due to lack of research by mixing heliocentric and geocentric cosmology together causing incoherence that pushes the viewer away from learning. Why would a lie like this exist? What purpose does this level of deception seek to gain? The hard, solid truth is that all the known space agencies and related industries have made untold amounts of money for many, many years, providing nothing but CGI, fisheye lens curvature, and Hollywood-style productions as proof. The following evidence should speak for itself through the testimonies of these professionals, pilots, and witnesses. To find yourself, think for yourself. The most courageous act is to think for yourself. Our greatest wish is for minds opened, questions answered, and the reign of freedom through truth revealed. Trying to get information out of me, and I'm not too familiar with the subject. Uh, help me out. Yes, sir. Copy that. I'll give you a couple of relatively quick examples that you can also research and elaborate as well. Uh, number one, you know I'm a pilot, and when I used to fly out of Long Island towards Nantucket, bottom line here is they're going to give you some type of formula for every hundred miles. They're going to give you some type of X, Y, Z per kilometer squared. Keep it very, very simple. Every hundred miles would be approximately one mile. One mile is 5,280 feet. The actual number is 6666, which you know, is of Luciferian origin, which really reveals who's behind all the conspiracy and cover-ups you know, for everything. But the bottom line here is a very simple formula is for every 100 miles, you have 5,280 feet, which is one mile of curvature. So 100 miles equals one mile of curvature. Now, if I'm going, let's say, hypothetically, from Long Island to Nantucket, that's about a buck and a half, about 150 miles. So it should be a mile and a half. So let's just take a mile. So with aviation, you fly at certain altitudes, whether you're flying in a easterly, a northeasterly, to a southwesterly direction. So hypothetically, I'm flying easterly at hypothetically 40, about 4,000 feet, which is an even number. If you add 5,000 feet of curvature, that would be around 9,480 feet, which does not exist. So the bottom line is pilots know every 100 miles that you travel, you would be dipping the nose down to stay for one mile, which is 5,280 feet of curvature. 
So there's the proof right there that there's something very fishy with this globe Earth situation because scientifically it doesn't matter. My name is Joshua Silva. I am a licensed commercial pilot and flight instructor. I have had a lifelong love of aviation and aerospace. And when growing up, I even fancied myself an amateur astronomer. Um, I would drag my family and friends, anybody I could, to every air show I could possibly find in Northern California. I was the only kid you knew, or anybody knew, that knew the various components on aircraft, spacecraft by heart. Um, I absolutely loved anything to do that anything to do with flying or space. But my love of aviation and aerospace never stopped. I continued studying, had an entire library full of aviation books of various military and civilian aircraft, military history, every aviation campaign and theater in almost any war. I studied religiously and it was just out of pure passion. Later in life, many years later, I decided to become a pilot. Um, as strange as it may sound, it hadn't occurred to become a pilot up to that point. I just simply loved aviation and aerospace, but I decided to become a pilot and I began attending a prestigious flight academy in the Midwest and attending university at the same time and to gain a degree in aeronautics and aerospace. Shortly thereafter, I began flying twin turboprop aircraft out of Northern California for several nonprofit organizations and years after that I found myself flight instructing for various small flight schools both in California and in Arizona and then on to large academies that trained for the airlines and even some military flights. Shortly thereafter I began flying regional business jets and that's when the story of me finding the topic of flat earth started. Hola, mi nombre es Héctor Requena, soy terraplanista desde el 2016. Este tema lo descubrí accidentalmente, me agradó mucho y desde ahí lo empecé a investigar. Desde ahí me di cuenta de lo que está pasando en el mundo. Yo fui aviador, me gusta más la palabra aviador que piloto. Yo volé con mi papá desde niño, él era piloto de la Fuerza Aérea Mexicana. Un tema muy muy curioso que me pasó a mí fue el, el empezar a conocer cómo funciona el giroscopio. El giroscopio está diseñado para volar sobre un plano, sobre un terreno plano y una tierra que no se mueve. Todos estos temas me llevaron a, a seguir investigando, investigando. Estamos tratando de invitar a la gente a que no se cierre de mente a, a estos temas, ya que si no nos damos cuenta de lo que está pasando ahorita es por lo mismo porque la gente está cerrada, se cierra a pensar fuera de la caja. I've been a military brat all my life. However, I've been in the industry of aviation for the last 21 years. And I became an FE somewhere around 15 or 16. When I really started looking at conspiracies, uh, I looked into Benghazi because I happened to work on government contracts abroad, overseas. But I've been in aviation for 21 years, anything from helicopters to aerostats to big birds, little birds, fighter jets, things with engines, no engines, big blades, little blades, compressor blades, which, by the way, that one's not a hoax. Jets do not run only on compressed air. Contrary to popular belief, it takes compressed air in a blended ratio of air to fuel to drive the now heated gas and rotate the compressor blades. This has been a topic of a discussion between FE and, you know, not everything's a hoax. Coriolis effect, with that ties into, obviously with no spin around the axis points that they say exist at 23.4, conveniently 66 off the, the 90 degrees, right? Everything ties into 666 with NASA and all the BS scientists. Our aircraft have things called ADIs, Attitude Direction Indicator, which gives correlation between the aircraft housing or the shell 
around the gyro itself. The ADI is nothing more than a gyro that will always reference level. I don't care what any pilot says. I don't care what any mechanic tells you. You know, there's a reason that pilots have one book called the Pilot Operating Handbook, and there's every other book, right? From structures to avionics to wiring diagrams to the actual components that make up these systems. That is a standalone system. The ADI does not lie. You don't care how cold it is, how high you are, and some of these guys are pretty damn high. It doesn't matter where you're going. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter where you are over the realm itself. I woke up to the truth of the flat earth, shape of the earth, as an engineer and a pilot. So I've studied engineering, physics, three different ways, basic physics, electric physics, and construction physics. And also as a pilot, as a rotary wing pilot, that is hel helicopter pilot, I studied aeronautical physics as well. So I can cover and discuss just about any factor of flat earth. N not that I'm any smarter than anybody else, but I've studied quite a bit of factors that analyze shape and motion of, of just about any object, that's physics, also aeronautical physics, and principles of flight. I can tell you this, airplanes fly straight and level, that's even an aviation term, straight and level. Airplanes will fly for hours at the same altitude, never dipping their nose down to follow the curve of the earth. An aircraft on a 12-hour or even 18-hour flight from Portland, Oregon to Seoul, Korea, that would have that aircraft starting at one point and then flying so far around the earth that it's flying downwards with its nose vertically downwards and then starting to go around, around the curve of the earth so that the airplane is now flying upside down. Would have to make that kind of a flight path on a globe, which is it's such an absurdity. So that being said, I come into the true shape of the earth, the flat earth. As a skeptic, like most anyone else, I'll tell you my story. My buddy told me about this. He said, Rob, you need to learn about the ice ring. You need to learn that the earth doesn't move. This globe is garbage. And I laughed at him. I said, are you kidding me? I'm not going to, I'm not even going to look into that. And he said, that's fine. He said, that's fine. You don't have to look into flat earth. But if, until you do, he said, until you do look into flat earth, you will remain a slave of the matrix. And interestingly enough, at this point, this was more or less November, December 2015. I had already mentally resigned from the US military for three years. I had already resigned because of Benghazi. I realized and I saw for myself, I'd been working with US as an army officer working for State Department for a good 10 years. And so what I did, I turned my physics awareness, I turned my, my studies into analysis of the shape of the earth. I have a bachelor's degree in English and international business and a master's degree in emergency management. Emergency management is an area of study that deals with lessening the effects of a natural or man-made disaster. Areas I had to study related to emergency management were meteorology, geology, geography, hydrology, and oceanography. You have to know well how Earth works in order to prevent or lessen the consequences of a natural disaster. In 2019, I wrote the book called 16 Emergency Landings Proving Flat Earth. Not many people know that when I was younger, I worked for an international airline. I worked at the International Cargo and Logistics Division of the company at Sao Paulo International Airport. I had to know all international routes in order to provide our clients the precise information about imports and exports as well as the logistics of transporting cargo internationally. Our company transported from a simple parcel package to cars and helicopters to anywhere in the world. Having access to all areas of the airport in 1988, the Brazilian soccer team was about to board their flight towards Australia to take part of the Bicentennial Soccer Cup in Australia. 
It was a tournament to celebrate Australia's 200th birthday. Two South American teams were invited to take part in this tournament, Brazil and Argentina. At that time, we had access to several maps, all based on the Globe Earth model. The Brazilian squad left to Australia, a natural conclusion is that this charter flight was going to Australia over the Pacific Ocean, as the global model suggests. Perhaps I stopped in Santiago, Chile, and then head to Australia. To my surprise, the flight went to Los Angeles. For several days, I could not comprehend the reason why that flight went to Los Angeles in North America to then go towards Australia in the Southern Hemisphere. This thing kept alive in the back of our mind for all these years. I'm a merchant marine. I've been selling 15 years. I graduated from the Paul Hall Maritime Center out of Piney Point, Maryland. I primarily sell on container ships, tankers, drill ships, military cargo vessels, you name it, I can sell on it. I sell in the capacity of Bosun. I hold the title as AB Unlimited. That primarily sell deep sea and coastal, meaning up and down the coast, west coast, east coast, and deep sea is out deep sea across to uh, other continents. What led me to the flat earth was actually uh, my sister. We've always been into the conspiracies and the 9-11 and Sandy Hook and all that stuff. And uh, one day she said, hey, you want to see a conspiracy? You should look into the flat earth. And I, I looked at her and laughed because I had seen the videos come up in the feed and they showed that disc thing in the space and I laughed at it and <laughs> whatever. And she showed it to me and I laughed at her. And I went and pulled out my phone and I looked up a video. You can look it up. It's called Dragon Link FPV to Space. And what you'll see is basically an RC airplane that's been taken up about 80,000 feet and they release it and then the airplane comes down with power and it has the drag link system which is capable of making control and video. Anyways, and, but they had a GoPro so you see this curved globe and you know that set it for me when I saw that I was like oh wow look at that so I brought that down to her put it right in her face and said, look at that. And I, looking back, I remember her smile on it was like, you know, okay, she wasn't gonna argue with me. And she said, okay. Later on, I don't know, a couple days later, whenever I seen it in there and I said, all right, I had nothing to watch. I hit it on the YouTube and I knew within 10 minutes of it, I, do, I forget which one it was. I think it was probably uh, one of the documentaries, but it was almost like I instantly knew. And then what happened was, is a lot of the proofs that I had were before I was a flat earther, such as, seeing contacts at 30 miles out with the naked eye on the horizon, which is impossible on the globe model. So much so, it was me, the third officer, and the lookout. We were standing our watch, and we were, I believe we were in the Mediterranean Sea. Look out, look and, look and watch, I say, okay, we got a contact out there. We look and we look and we try and get it on the radar. We get it at 30 miles out. When the chief mate came up, we had told him, hey mate, we got a contact earlier 30 miles out. He said, bull crap, I don't believe you. And we all looked at each other and shook our heads and yeah, yep, yeah, they got it. And we He stormed off the bridge, ran down, came back up. He had the Bowditch, which is a green, thick green book that's everything you ever need to know about being on the ocean, sailing, navigation, everything. And he comes up and he says, the math doesn't lie. And he slams down this piece of paper and he says, our bridge height is at 100 feet versus how far, 30 miles. It should have been behind like 600 foot of curve. I remember 600 something foot. He had all the mathematical course. I didn't know, you know, okay, that's good. All right, he must know what he's talking about. But we're looking like, well, I don't know. We got it on the radar. Then the radar must not know what it's doing. You can just call me Jay. That's what my friends call me. That's what I go by. I just go by Jay. My work experience, I joined the Navy when I was 17 years old. I had a secret security clearance. There's different levels of security clearance. There's a, like a lower level, then there's a secret, which is what I had, which is like a mid-level, and then there's a top secret. I did not have a top secret clearance, so there's a lot that I don't know. But I did have a secret clearance. So it's basically the, the mid-level security clearance um, for the government that I had. And I did that job for eight years. I worked in operational intelligence specifically. The radar navigation, um, there's a limited scope of what we're able to see. Now, granted, this is 15 or 20 years ago. 
what I mean by that is with it being 15 or 20 years ago, the technology nowadays on the new warships, I would imagine are just off the charts advanced compared to what we had, you know, 20 years ago in the early 2000s when I was uh, doing deployments for the Navy. We're looking at the scope of the radar. Now, this is just going off of the actual screen that we can see. Now, there's there's three different screens. There's the basic radar screen where we have this limited scope where it only goes out like 25 miles, right? Then there's this other bigger screen, and I forgot the name of it, but it's like it goes onto this huge projection in the Combat Information Center. Basically, is where all of the information is housed. And on this huge screen, we can actually zoom out and see a significant portion of our area of responsibility. I can't say the exact number. Again, a lot of this is classified. Basically, when we zoom out onto this large projectile screen, it goes in and out, right? So the reason why we're able to zoom in and then pull back out is just for accuracy. So if we're looking at something that could just be like a buoy in the water, right? You know, just one of the little tiny buoys that track that the ships can use as kind of placements to track where they're going that can be mistaken for an actual like small watercraft so we have to be able to differentiate between that and some of the ships that we're looking for because some of the deployments we're on we're out there looking for drug ships we're looking for other types of ships submarines basically just to keep a track of everything that's basically what the navy and coast guard do they want to make sure that they know what's going on in the seas and that's kind of the way the united states navy run operates they're basically dictating what happens in, in international waters I will be providing my in-depth experience of U.S. Navy submarines and how they prove we do not live on a globe Earth. However, due to the nature of my job and the security clearance that I hold, I wish to remain anonymous. I've worked for the U.S. Department of the Navy as a Submarine Quality Assurance Specialist for the last five years. My job is to ensure that each submarine is built properly, safely, and to the engineer's plan. I have an intimate knowledge of every aspect of each submarine being built in the shipyard I work in. Now that you've heard a little bit of my background, let me explain how I arrived at the crazy notion that the Earth is visibly and observably flat. I have always questioned the reality around me since I was little. I never followed anything mainstream, and I was never interested in what the news had to say. As I got older, I started looking into more and more things out of my own curiosity, 9-11, school shootings, I eventually started researching the moon landing because it just never sat well with me. And it didn't take long for me to completely unravel that for the hoax that it is. After that, I was starting to realize that we had been lied to on so many levels what else could there possibly be? Then I saw a video about the flat earth pop up on my YouTube recommendations. At first, even with my awakened mind, I thought this was absolutely ridiculous. I decided that I'd look into it simply to disprove it and move on. It should be easy, right? That was over six years ago, and I still can't disprove the flat earth. In fact, the more I research it, the more it reveals. This leads me into my submarine experience. 
looking back on everything I had accomplished while on active duty with eyes to see. I was, has only served to solidify my stance that we live on a flat and motionless plane. The theory of more land being hidden on Earth as one of the possible motives to hide the fact that the Earth is not a spinning water ball corkscrewing through space is something that many flat Earthers have postulated over the years. And I just couldn't shake the concept from my mind where, just like Rear Admiral Richard Byrd suggested during his Antarctic expedition Operation Hijump, that there is undiscovered land on Earth and that possibility spawned an idea to write the elusive bird, a modern day quest to discover another world. The Elusive Curve is a fictional novel, credited to convey a very non-fictional message, that the Earth is a flat, motionless, level plane devoid of any curvature. When Max Carter discovers irrefutable proof of the true shape of the Earth, the course of his life drastically changes, and he becomes a man obsessed, convinced that there is more land being hidden beyond Antarctica, and that he is going to reach it. The elusive curve debunks typical globe bird claims including ships disappearing over the horizon due to the curve of the Earth, the Foucault's pendulum and the Coriolis effect, whilst presenting flat Earth proofs like visual perspective, level water over vast distances and long distance photography, all within the context of Max's varied and colourful relationships. Also, there's a semi-classified naval communication device when ships are communicating ship to ship on the ocean, U.S. Navy, semi-classified laser communication NAVCOM device, which also does data as well. So if they're communicating on ships 70 miles, 100 miles or more, like I said, every 100 miles is a mild curvature. So it wouldn't work because lasers operate line of sight. They operate in a straight line. There's no curvature to the laser. So the bottom line here is the naval NAVCOM classified, semi-classified system that they use to communicate ship to ship, that operates on a laser, and if there was curvature, anything over, like I said, 100 miles is 5,280 feet of curvature, and the ship's diameter is nowhere near that, which, which you know. So there's another example, the naval NAVCOM communication device. Also, there's a woman, a female KLH pilot, KLH uh, Dutch Commercial Airlines. She got fired from her job a while back for questioning this issue. Now, they didn't throw her out of the company, but they gave her like a desk job, so this way they kind of keep her out of quiet so they can control. But she's a very sane and rational woman. If they ask her, you know, what happened, and she starts talking, it's going to raise serious questions. So we got the KLH pilot, we got the Laser NAVCOM, U.S. Navy. Uh, we've got my personal experience flying from Long Island to Antarctica. This would be at least 5,280 feet of curvature, added to the 4,000 altitude average while heading easterly. So there's something very wrong there. The numbers don't work. Could the Earth actually be flat? I began to see opinions and arguments that seemed logical. But I heard several arguments, which I now know were most likely disinformation, easily disprovable in the aviation world. But there were some that stuck with me. And so myself being the way I am, I ran quickly, metaphorically, to my old textbook. And I opened my old textbooks, found them, unpacked them, cracked them all open, and even downloaded new, brand new copies in PDF form offline of all these books to make sure that nothing had been changed. I thought for certain that I knew exactly what compensation pilots are trained while flying to compensate for the spin or the rotation of the Earth, for instance. As far as falling around a globe, that assumed, I assumed in my mind would be an aircraft's angle of attack. But upon more study, I found that not to be true. The angle of attack being the angle between the aircraft's flight path and the relative wind, which is something that pilots are very familiar with. 
and it's the idea that an aircraft has to be slightly pitched up essentially to stay airborne or a surface of that aircraft has to be pitched slightly to create a difference in air pressure to hold the aircraft aloft. And that is assumed or was assumed at, my, at that time by myself and other pilots to be the compensation one would make for falling around a globe while flying, period. But upon further research, I found that this was not the case and it was not even mentioned anywhere. This compensation was not mentioned anywhere I could find in any resource that I had gone to flight school with. And they were extensive. There were many, many books, especially as one progressed towards the commercial flying side, especially elective courses, especially if you're going to university as I was studying aerospace, then you would assume, and I had assumed that this was calculated for. Again, as far as ADIs in every aircraft, it references the level horizon or references sea level always. There's no way that you can convince somebody of sound mind that if you take off from New York and immediately flip upside down, now your housing or your ADI is referencing upside down to you because you're upside down. It's right side up. It cannot deviate off level. It doesn't matter how much fuel you got in your tanks. It doesn't matter if you're a helicopter or an aerostat or a fighter jet. That gauge will always reference level. It has to, because otherwise it would be a pull reference. And if you could manipulate it, why would you even have it in the airplane or your aircraft? But if you go and take off two miles away, do a barrel roll, you're now flying upside down. At what point does that gauge show you back right side up? A half a hemisphere away? Is that what, is that what we're led to believe? Is that what we're supposed to believe? At what point does it, does it right itself? If you never flipped back over, and continue flying level. You, know, you see what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's ridiculous. It's ludicrous to think that that thing compensates for curvature in straight and level flight. The big one that is oftentimes quoted is compensation for Coriolis effect while flying. And this is something I'd even taught my students about, and it's always assumed to be correct. We just assume. We're given the narrative from a young age and we everything is built upon that assumption, upon that theory. And so I thought I had the, the silver bullet. Ah, Coriolis effect. We always calculate for that. Well, as I began to look through the books and to look into the calculations given for Coriolis effect, the narrative began to fall apart even further. I began to see things I didn't notice when I was in school, such as Coriolis effect is actually never calculated for but is assumed to be a part of wind correction angle. Wind correction angle is one of the many calculations pilots of all kinds make while flying to correct against winds in whatever volume or section of air they're flying through, which it could be from any direction and you're flying through it, so you have to compensate a certain angle into that wind to hold a straight line. Interesting side note, I worked on aerostats for several years and I always ask people who try to bring up gravity, well, how come my 4,000 pound, 74,000 cubic foot aerostat isn't getting pushed towards ground? It weighs more than you do, which you believe gravity is pushing you down, right? Because these are some dense ass people. But how come the aerostat's not getting driven into the ground? It weighs more, it's definitely larger than a, you know, the size of a house. It's more than most size of most houses. You know, so why isn't it getting driven to the ground? Well, that's because it's displacing less weight than the atmosphere or the medium that it's in and I try explaining that I don't know how many times you've probably posted something on this I don't know how many times we're gonna have to post something on this but every time that little kid lets go of that helium balloon and starts crying radar is simply another form of radio transmission radio in includes anything within the the range of the electromagnetic spectrum Electromagnetic spectrum, also known as light. Radio is the transmission of light, whether it's visible light or radio waves which are not visible. When it comes to radio transmissions, there must be a transmitter and a receiver. There can be a reflector or a transmittal unit along the way. However, in the end, there's got to be at least transmitter and a receiver. 
And in the case of radar, radar transmits a signal and it bounces off a reflector and then it comes back to the receiving station. Or it can go to other stations if they're set up in the network properly. Long story short, radar emits a signal, it bounces off something, and then it, and then it returns to a receiving unit and the receiving unit maps that reflection accordingly. If there is no reflector, then there's no return signal, and then the object does not show up on the radar, for example, it's the off the screen. Notice, there's no curving around anything. It goes out in a straight line. Radio signals always travel in a straight line. So the transmitter sends the, the signal out to the, the target, bounces off, and it comes back in a straight line. Radar cannot travel over the curve, and hence, radar is dependent on line of sight, direct, direct beam from the transmission to the target. It reflects and it comes straight back. There is no curving around anything, thus is radar. Also radar, radar works in straight lines. The radar is incapable of curving around a curve, picking up and bouncing back the reflection of what it's picking up. So if you can imagine a ship on the other side of the curve, we'll say 30 miles, 40 miles out, it sends out the radar beam. The radar beam is supposedly curving around this ball, bouncing back and then bouncing the reflection curving back around to be picked up by the radar. That's not happening. It's flying out straight and when it picks up something, it hits it back straight. It's not going around any curve. That's that's plain and simple. That can be looked up on your YouTube and see how radar waves work. They don't go around the curve. Every diagram shown will show you straight lines. They don't they don't show you curved lines. As we zoom out to look at the larger scope of things, once we verify that, we're able to zoom out over a large distance. Now over this screen, at the time I was like 18 or 19 years old, all right, when I was doing this job. I wasn't thinking about flat earth and any of this other shit. I, I was still indoctrinated and under the assumption that the earth is a spinning ball. I never thought about flat earth or anything like that, but I always thought it was weird that as I'm looking at this massive radar screen, I always used to think, how come we're looking at this and I can see like we're off of the coast of Argentina, for, for instance, right? Like, how is it that I can see this far out and it's not like, over the horizon or curve because it's so far. Uh, like I said, we use a lot of these other link signals and they're called links. They're, they go by different names. I can't say the code names. Some of them I forgot. Some of them are, again, this is classified information. I can't give any specifics on these, but um, some of the links that we use, not only do, like I said, not only do we speak to the actual ships and track them, but we speak to aircraft, 10,000, 20,000, 30 and higher, 30,000 feet and higher is what I'm saying. It's not just a matter that they're 30,000 feet directly. It's not like they're directly above the ship. This is what's interesting is this aircraft could be 50, 60 miles away and 30,000 feet in the air. So you understand like the angle that you have to take to be able to track this aircraft from a ship that's moving on the water. Think about that for a second. I served on board of a United States 688I fast attack nuclear submarine. And I can personally attest that we never constantly angled down during our submarine deployments. One of our longest transits went from the Gulf of Oman around the southern tip of Africa and back to Connecticut. We were underwater for almost three months straight. My job on board as a radioman meant that I spent a lot of time both in the radio room and in the control room. The control room is where they navigate and drive the submarine. I never once in my five years active duty heard the officer of the deck or the diving officer give the order to consistently change the angle of the submarine to compensate for the curvature of the earth. The primary task of the diving officer and the helms and planesmen is to maintain the submarine 
as level as possible while in transit. If the Earth had any measurable curvature, I am certain we would not have been able to make this incredibly long transit without accounting for it. And then the big one is given after that. Well, GPS auto corrects for it. And that sent me down yet another path. GPS auto corrects for it. If it's a satellite based system, how is it correcting for spin if it's also spinning over the same body? And why are there large gaps in GPS coverage over large oceanic bodies? Do they just turn them off? It's just not worthwhile. There have been enough aviation accidents at sea, very far from shore, that would say otherwise. And if you gave the American taxpayers, the ones funding these satellites that are supposed to track aircraft, the information that, well, we're just shutting them off because it's not worthwhile, those three or four jets full of hundreds of passengers just have to use other navigation methods such as dead reckoning, which is basically using a stopwatch and guessing to the next checkpoint, essentially. If you were to tell them that, they would be infuriated. So that could not be the case. Coverage was a problem, even over large and non-densely populated areas, you would lose GPS coverage, even in jets at times. So this began to unravel the thread of satellites and satellite timing, and the fact that many reels of footage show these satellites being launched by balloon rather than by rockets. How the concept of these rockets doesn't even work to make it pass the atmosphere, much less leave something in perfect geosynchronous orbit. I actually had the privilege of working a short time at a satellite manufacturing company in Northern California. Got to see the assembly and participate in the assembly of satellites, base based satellites or so they are said. There would be small bottles encased in these structures that were encased by another structure. The small bottles were the fuel cells. These fuel cells were incredibly small, smaller than a diver's tank in most cases, much smaller. And this was supposed to be all the fuel that the craft needed to run and operate, as most are not actually electric, they're becoming electric now, and sustain itself in a perfect orbit by just small bursts from its engine or its propulsion system. But truth be told, I've been to many countries, done many things, all things aviation. I can say with absolute certainty, and I can attest the plane does not dip nose down to follow the curvature of the Earth, ever. Matter of fact, most planes have an airfoil that are three degrees nose up in straight and level flight. And the reason that is, is simple. If the nose of the aircraft was at zero degrees or level flying through the air, then it would porpoise, right? It would be kind of violent because some of the air would go over the nose and some of the air would go under the nose. And it would cause that nose to go up and down, up and down, which is literally like a porpoise or a dolphin out of water. And that's exactly what would happen. So it's the wings are designed when they are level, the nose is three degrees nose up. The fact proven from multiple points that there is no Coriolis to the motion of the earth. And I'm speaking from a pilot's perspective, also an engineer's perspective, because I obtained a degree as an engineer before I went to flight school. So I'm, a, I'm both a pilot engineer at once. So, number one, there is no rotation of the Earth, proven by the fact that a helicopter pilot can hover the aircraft indefinitely, motionless, above a single point of the Earth. If the Earth were spinning, as soon as that aircraft left the ground, the Earth would spin out from under it. Now, somebody may say that the air of the atmosphere rotates along with the Earth, which is one of the most absurd concepts imaginable, because if that were the case, then all wind would travel with the Earth. There would be no alternating wind currents when we know that the jet streams fly overhead clouds move in multiple directions overhead and a kite flying over the stationary earth the fact that a, a kite flies because of wind passing through, that proves that the earth does not that proves that the air does not move in unison with the earth number two airstrips do not rotate away from a landing aircraft anybody who's seen a, a pilot's view when an aircraft lands well the aircraft lands to a motionless airstrip. If the, the earth were rotating, the pilot would have to turn to the angle at which the airstrip is rotating away and land at the speed of the airstrip, which is absurd, simply absurd. A airstrips do not rotate away from the aircraft, and on an east to west landing strip, if the aircraft is landing to the west, the airstrips do not land 
moving towards the air airplane. That's that's insanity. Okay, simply stated. If the Earth was a spinning ball, it is virtually impossible for a ship to be moving at 25 to 30 knots on this curb spinning ball while tracking an aircraft that's probably going 300 miles per hour 50 to 100 miles away really i mean they, these like p3 aircrafts were pretty far and 20,000 feet in the air it's just virtually impossible it doesn't make sense again at the time i wasn't thinking like this but looking back on the information that i had I'm like, yeah, there's no way. There's no way that that was done on a, on a curved earth. Literally, the only way that could work is if we are on a flat stationary plane, we're cruising along, the boat is cruising along in the water. Like, think about it in terms of like a large, like, you know, like those backyard swimming pools. Picture the swimming pool filled up, right? And then your ship, you put a little boat on the swimming pool and then, you know, you put like a little fake aircraft in the air. Now, from that ship, you're able to see the aircraft. It doesn't matter where you are in that pool, you can track that aircraft. If you're on a spinning ball curve, how the hell can you track an aircraft that could be in a position that's 100 to 200 miles away from you, 30,000 feet in the air from a different angle that's around a curve? It's impossible. There's no way that you could, there's no radio frequency that could track that. I'd like to point out that I see now that I, I didn't see before is that you have a magnetic compass and you have a gyro on any ship. And I'm not talking about your little crabberman show fishing boat, one of the deadliest cat. I'm talking about a real deep sea going unlimited tonnage boat's going to have a gyro. And it is a big, huge box that sits be usually behind the bridge or in the chart room. It's a big box and it's basically the gyro compass. Now, if you had two models, I guess, wouldn't you have to have one making the corrections? Because it almost never matches the, the, the magnetic almost never matches the uh, gyro. It's very rare that we're steering the same course. And they say it's due to deviation and variation is where you, you know, like the metals of the ship causes it to, to differ. And then you have the variation of the magnetic fields over the earth is I guess they change, you know, true north and magnetic north. But the way I look at it is, man, they got two different machines. One is a machine and one is from God. The, the way to get around the earth, God's not a dummy. He put the way to get around the earth with the compasses. If back in the day they had motorized vessels that can get them around, they would probably have got around a lot better. But they were at the mercy of the wind. People was like, oh, they didn't know their way or, you know, they were using the stars and stuff and they... You know, so I just believe that the two compasses, the gyro compass that's electronic and then our regular compass is because they are switching the ways, you know, the maps. There's two different ways to get around the earth. They're tricking us. Here is another flat earth proof that I never noticed while I was on active duty thanks to years of indoctrination. Periscope observations. When the submarine is at periscope depth, and the observer is looking for ships on the horizon, they will start to see masts at about eight to nine miles, depending on atmospheric occlusion and sea state. The hull of the ships won't be visible until about five miles, depending on atmospheric occlusion and sea state. At nine miles away, the target should be 26 feet behind the curve. But this isn't what's observed. My final flat earth point on submarines is with regard to the ANWSN TAC-7 ring laser gyro that is used on board of US Navy submarines. A typical gyroscope, like the ones used on board of an aircraft, is a device used for measuring or maintaining orientation and angular velocity. It is either a spinning wheel or disc with a counterweight in which the axis of rotation is free to assume any orientation by itself. When rotating, the orientation of this axis is unaffected by tilting or rotation of the mounting according to the conservation of angular momentum. However, 
a ring laser gyro doesn't have any established weight. They use light as a point of reference. It spins up a disc that shoots out lasers, and it has a digital encoder that deciphers where the laser strikes inside of the gimbal system. No make-believe gravity required. Let's just say we're like 30 miles away. These missiles can shoot much further than that. I can't give you the exact number, but say we're 30 miles away, okay? 30 miles is far. So from our ship, we can track on our little, we have like a missile projectile. It's like a radar, but it's a little bit different. It's specifically designed to track the missiles. You and actually input the coordinates, latitude and longitude of where you want the missile to strike. Really, really high precision accuracy. I'm, I mean, really, act, really, really, really accurate. We hit that launch and the missile, and it will hit that target 30 miles away, even longer than that. Now, here's the thing. Again, that's not possible on a curved earth. These missiles are huge, you know, 50 caliber project that are carrying massive amounts of explosives in them, okay? Each one of these missiles are probably worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. So whenever you're lining up these missiles to shoot at targets that are 30 plus miles away, if the earth is spinning again now think about this we're not we're not sitting like on land holding a gun all right so picture this we're on a ship like actually in the middle of the water okay and the missile is shooting off of the bow of the ship so if the world is a spinning ball and we're, we're, we're on this curved earth with water and we're, we're spinning 600 miles per hour through infinite space um, I'm pretty sure that it would be physically like like it wouldn't even make any kind of sense on on a physics type level to be able to shoot a missile from a a, a, a spot in a water on a spinning ball to, to pinpoint accurately hit another spot. And at night we were going uh, on one ship on a military ship and this is with uh, night vision goggles. 50 miles and these guys were on the bow. They were not even on the bridge where you'd be a hundred foot up. They were on the bow, which is barely probably 40 feet off the off the water's edge. So these guys, and they, and they have the latest state of the art. This was in 2015, 2015, they had state of the art, what are they called, night vision goggles. So these things are capable of seeing that far if we live on a plane, you can't deny it. It was, it was so obvious but not to everyone else. I guess the programming's harder than other people. So they don't want to hear it. But over the years, I have learned the model. I know the model like the back of my hand. I can show proofs. I, I have ammo now. So when I go out there and I tell somebody, hey, that's impossible, you know, and I'm talking to a, a third mate or a second mate who's an officer who went to college, meaning they paid for their education. Because when you pay for your education and you're making a handsome salary on it, you can't be wrong. How could I be wrong? I'm making a salary, they're paying me. I paid for this career. Everything's working great in my life. You are obviously wrong. All the math works. So with that, you know, it's it's hard. But when you stump them and you start showing them stuff, it's hard for them to say. And then they start saying stuff like, oh, well, what does it matter anyways? I don't care. And there is the eight inches per mile squared. But you guys can't look at it three dimensionally. It is two dimensional. It is the amount of deviation that's required for you to come back inward. If you are walking east from north, meaning you are going around north equidistantly, and you walked in a straight line east one mile, you're gonna have to deviate eight inches back to the left to, to get back on the equator, right? Look at it on the flat earth map, and clearly it makes sense. If you walked one mile in a straight line east, you have to deviate eight inches after each mile to stay on the equator. The eight inches per mile squared is a real measurement. If in fact we consider the equator to be a real place, a real location, ever, always. In 2015, I came across YouTube suggestions for Flat Earth videos. My first reaction was to laugh off. After seeing Flat Earth videos in one of my favorite channels, I decided to watch one. When I came across a Flat Earth map, which I had never seen before, it immediately sparked me to look at that flight route, Rio Los Angeles, Sydney. 
and I could then understand why the Brazilian soccer team went to Los Angeles and then to Australia for the tournament. The earth is flat, no doubt about it. The following weeks and days were followed by more research and disbelief. I had been a NASA fanboy my whole life, paying two visits to NASA's Johnson Space Center in Huntsville, Alabama, besides spending so much money in science and science fiction related documentaries, movies, merchandise, etc. What a waste of time. I also tell mates about the, they lay down and we use all our charting is done on flat maps, straight lines. They never draw a curved line. Every line is straight, 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 straight lines, straight lines everywhere we go on a flat map. And I try to point it out to them. And what they tell me is Mr. Marcator has put all that in there for you. It's all equated in there for you. You don't have to worry about it. All the curvature calculations for it and everything's figured right into the uh, the map. So the straight lines and everything are actually bending somehow, I don't know. So these are just the proofs that I see. Along with, you can see the crepuscular rays are much betterly observed out at sea because you can, there's, it's nothing, it's like a desert. And so you can see the sun like a flashlight just shining down in a cone. Everywhere, if there's a little bit of a clouds are right, it looks like a cone. And I point it out all the time to these guys. And I get them thinking, but you know, the programming goes hard on, on, on people. And uh, if you're not ready to wake up, well, you're not ready to wake up. You'll just have one foot in, one foot out. You'll be back in the illusion before you know it. The narrative began to fall, fall apart. I would continue studying and finding that what I fear to be true is reality. That we have been lied to about just about everything. Upon researching military history and then military training and speaking with military gunners in both the Army and the Marine Corps that I know personally, I would ask them about Coriolis effect. And it was always assumed that, yeah, we, we compensate for the Earth being, you know, a curve, uh, the curve that it would drop. We, we, we calculate for the Earth curvature. But even upon asking and having them look into their materials further and my own personal study, again, it found to be an assumed truth with no actual basis in reality that they would calculate bullet fall based upon angular velocity, drop, friction, amongst other things. And curvature was supposed to be just corrected along with it, just like flying wind correction angle corrected for Coriolis effect. I've done many of them personally. I've flown more than 1,070 hours both helicopters and airplanes and I will tell you factually that aircraft meet their checkpoints they take off they meet their checkpoints and they land exactly as planned on a flat stationary map no pilot I say again no pilot has ever has ever accommodated for the rotation of the earth when planning flights and take off to checkpoints checkpoints along the way and then landing pilots can plan so well that they can take off and land hundreds of miles away down to within 30 seconds of their planning because the earth simply does not rotate a waypoint would be like this like let's say we're out in the middle of the water and we want to hit a target that's like directly to our west 15 miles away but that target is able to track our missile coming at them we don't want that target to know where the missile's coming from so we can put in waypoint and a waypoint would be like putting a point out like 20 miles east and then another point like 15 miles north and then another point like 10 miles south of that and then put in our target you see what i'm saying so the missile doesn't go directly from the ship to the target the missile goes the missile will actually fly to the latitude and longitude of the waypoints that are put in and then it will curve from there and it will hit all the waypoints and then attack the target how is that possible on a spinning earth if the, if the earth is moving at 600 something miles per hour or, or whatever they say it is there's no way that missile could stay. There's no way that missile would be able to keep track. Do you understand what I'm saying? At least that's how I'm looking at it. It may be a little bit harder to visualize if you actually weren't seeing it the way that I would see it, or there, or or understanding and putting in putting in the coordinates or seeing how this actually worked out. But I'm telling you, like from my perspective, it is that is one of the things that makes it virtually impossible to accept the globe as this. Well, it's a, it's a fake lie. It's a theory. It's garbage, is what it is. Y'all think the earth is the ball. Y'all think.
think it's spinning through outer space. And I said, we am the green alien. Well, actually, the Earth is flat. Here, I'll give you facts. All the math, science, and all of that. Whatever you need to believe. Come on, can't you see that a submarine couldn't use a periscope? No plane use a gyroscope. But Huey doesn't adjust for the Coriolis. Or sniper looking down the scope. This is all hard to take in and hard to cope. But I hope that I've given enough rope to explore the rabbit hole. That our Earth is not a ball and it's not spinning through outer space. If someone wants to prove me wrong, please give me a name. And we can debate it all day, anytime, man. With real test measurements and evidence, stop lying to world nations. We have real science to back our observations. Don't believe in the indoctrination of the people, cause they don't want you to believe that the earth is level. Don't believe in the indoctrination of the people, cause they don't want you to believe that the earth is level. Dig deeper, be a rebel, then dig deeper than a shovel Keep your mind level, let's lighten the curve, enlighten the herd Give the truth what it deserves, tell about what we actually observe Like a boat going out of sight, if you get your zoom and focus right It'll come back into light, just use a laser beam and you will see That water never bends, but always finds a flat resting position 71% water can't make up a ball or a pair So let me make this clear and get it into your Ear. You're in great fear of stepping out of the box They're keeping food stamps in our socks They are the slyest of the fox In a controlled delusion of evolution That's nothing made everything And no proof of creation In this pseudoscience indoctrination No meaningful salvation But let's believe in gravity With no proof of how it picks and chooses What can rise and what can fall On this crazy thing we call a spinning ball Believe the indoctrination of the people, they don't want you to believe the earth is level. Don't believe the indoctrination of the people, they don't want you to believe the earth is level, level, level. level Let me level, give level. you something else to measure. Don't worry, it's my pleasure. If you want to vacuum or pressure, you must have a container, and that's a no brainer. But since we believe the Universe is on a roller coaster ride, even when Polaris is in the same place every night and has been for thousands of years. Has the heavens work like gears, telling us time and the years like a big machine? The heliocentric model is just a drink backed by money and based on influence theories, never providing hard evidence except for CGI and camera trickery of my natural senses in our school systems. But flat earth rings. Meaning to your existence like a period at the end of a sentence Don't believe in the indoctrination of people They don't want you to believe that the earth is level When it comes to a deception this big It's hard to dismiss And for the people that say I don't see how this would affect me either way. You don't know. It's like telling me about Argentina when you've never been there. Or it's like telling me about owning a Corvette when you've never driven one. You haven't experienced it. And if you have been through the Flat Earth Awakening, you know how it would affect you. This quite possibly may be the biggest awakening of mankind. Think about it. If you believe in this mass fallacy, You've been robbed of some senses and you don't even realize it. You don't trust your sense of touch or feel. You don't trust your sense of sight. You've been told the earth wobbles, spins, and orbits, but you don't feel a thing. You've been told that sunsets can't exist on a flat and stationary plane, but you don't understand the vanishing point of the law of perspective. After it's possible to understand and decode a mass deception, it becomes a lot easier to understand other lies. It opens your eyes and raises your discernment. So when it comes to lies like JFK, the moon landing, chemtrails, fluoridation, 9-11, etc. This is one of the most important factors of life I've ever been awakened up to. If it's possible to open your mind to this, your receptors will connect so much faster and stronger than you've ever experienced in your life. Understanding the ground you walk on every day 
and the illuminaries that go over your head every day, which I still don't understand all of its entirety, can change your life forever. Knowing you are specifically, intelligently, and uniquely designed so you know mentally, physically, and spiritually your vibration, energy, and frequency of life. So don't act like this doesn't matter. We've been lied to on a mass caliber. We can prove we live on a flat and stationary plane with observable, repeatable, testable experiments with data, hypothesis, and conclusions without depending on blind faith, indoctrinated, religious, theoretical, nihilistic, opinionated philosophies. That's the difference. Is it possible that almost everything that we were taught from the time of our innocent adolescent time as children to the completion of our chosen half of studies in college was not only incorrect, but was part of an educational doctrine of spiritual disconnectedness from what truth is and what our reality in the world that we occupy today. What if I told you that this is but a small capsule in a puzzle that was well planned and engineered by a world control system to propagate a catalog of theoretical studies and sciences that in some cases have never been proven to this very day, nor will it ever be proven to ascertain this fact. Humanity appears to have been hoodwinked into a dumbest state of who we are, where did we come from, and are we unique in God's creation concerning a geocentric world, or are we in a heliocentric world based on theoretical studies by a Jesuit astronomer named Nicholas Copernicus. He suggested this in 1543. His works were not released until after he died because he himself didn't believe in the spin ball theory either that is taught still today at the highest levels of education on my book, which is the Pharisee plan agenda that has gone on for 474 years seems to be threatened to become full disclosure of the biggest lie in the history of mankind that is kept by the world's oldest secret society called the Freemasons. The very uniqueness of humankind was spelled out correctly by our creator that the earth was the center of the universe and that he created the sun and the moon as well as the stars and the constellations that revolve around the earth with Polaris being the north magnetic whole big star. How could space possibly exist when you and I have never been in our entire lives seen a real photo of what our own world looks like? Max must constantly deal with the stigma and ridicule of being the crazy flat earther from friends and family and bombardment of typical questions like, why would they lie? How could so many people keep, keep such a big secret? And what does the shape of the earth even matter anyway? The elusive curve presents all the main arguments for a flat earth and solid arguments against a spinning ball earth in a fun and realistic story format, recommended for all flat earthers and curious minded people alike. Join Max on his journey as he attempts to convince his friends that the shape of the Earth is not what they know, while he plans for a mission to discover more up land on Earth with his ambitious and somewhat crazy plan to acquire a high altitude pseudo satellite to prove the shape of the Earth in one way or another. The, the Globers definitely scientifically were looking at flat earthers have some very, very, very valid points according to those three examples. Okay. You got it, brother. Anything else? Well, that about answers my question. Uh, quite a lot to take in. I, I've taken some notes. Thank you. Thank you again. You're welcome, sir. Any questions? I'll be here for a while. Contact me anytime. All right. God bless. All the best. God bless. Yo invito a la gente a que por lo menos sea un poco más abierta de mente hacia estos temas porque la verdad es...
esto está muy fuerte, se vienen tiempos muy difíciles ahorita y debemos de estar conscientes de que el sistema nos está manipulando de una manera muy, muy grande. Entonces, pues, vamos a ver qué pasa. So, that began my journey down the flat earth. And since that point, I've only found more and more voices, more and more educated people, educators, professionals, who are beginning to shed light on this subject in ways that I can only begin to imagine. But I'll never forget the day that I realized my plane wasn't falling around a globe, that I could look out the cockpit window, 185 degrees plus field of vision at 40,000 feet, and not see one iota of drop, but nothing but a flat, beautiful, motionless plane. The assumed calculations that we made that were compensating for Earth rotation were just a part of a calculation based upon wind speed and the angle we had to hold in order to fly against that wind and go in a straight line to our destination. It's one of the most freeing truths I've ever experienced because in some small way, the idea that these other conspiracy theories and things we've been lied to about are true, but this biggest one is the biggest truth of all. We've been lied to about everything. It means we can start over. We can start again. At this time, at this point in our history, we are uniquely positioned to make that change. And if I can make one statement to the people out there, it's simply this. That's it. That is level. You cannot fall off the edge of an in-ground pool. It is level. Where you put your feet in the water in France, it's the same height that you're going to put your feet in New Jersey and Brazil. Do some research. This is not the only thing out there that needs to be researched, unlearned and relearned. The Department of Education, founded by Rockefeller in 1908, did a good job of proving that the mode of ignorance that he calls his education board, you are the proof it's working. The mode of ignorance widens every day. It gets bigger and bigger every day because people keep believing what they spit out. Unlearn, thinking outside the box. The box is the cap that you got at graduation. So understand that for the first 18 years of your life, You didn't learn the truth about anything. You were simply told, and you got a reward for repeating it. Now it's time to think for yourself. It's time to do research and do your own testing. Be your own white coat. Knowing the earth is flat has placed me in sync with our creator, his creation, our hidden past, and with the future we hope to build. Future where we should not have an organization called United Nations governing the world. When there is no globe, there should be no globalization. This is my message to all of you. Peace. My message to the people is that if you're watching this documentary, and it strikes a chord with you, research it, find out more about it. So my message is research it, get all the ammo you can because if you try and go out and tell your family member or friends or co-workers and you try and tell them this, hey, that they're gonna laugh at you. And if you don't have the ammo to defend it or the right content to show or to start a kindle of fire with somebody's interest, if you don't have that, you're gonna get laughed. I made the mistake of when I just knew it right when I seen that video I said okay I, it makes so much sense I knew it right away I went and tried to tell everybody before I knew I just blurted out little proofs airplanes don't dip their nose the water lies for you know and they'd hit me with some of that science stuff you know that pseudoscience and I couldn't defend it and I would look like a fool and then when I had the knowledge you know it's harder to defend it because they've already don't take me serious but Now I've gained such a knowledge on it and such what you would call ammo that I can defend it in a way that you're going to get one of these reactions. Well, what does it matter if it's round or flat? My life doesn't change, you know, doesn't matter, you know, either way. That's how you know that you're, you're striking a chord. Their ego doesn't have any 
anywhere else to go so from there you can work on them but like i said learn the model learn to defend the flat earth model before you tell your co-workers loved ones or anybody you know for that matter that you you don't know because people you think that you uh, know well are going to look at you like you're crazy and unfortunately that's due to the programming and everybody believes one thing so how dare you believe another you gotta fall in line So if you're able to actually like open up your mind, look at things objectively, allow yourself to break free from the indoctrination bullshit that you were taught, you'll feel more free. You'll see the world differently. You'll love more deeply and compassionately. You'll appreciate life more. That's how I lived my life a couple years ago. Honestly, I can tell you this. I just hope and pray with all my heart that, you know, as the years go on, this is probably not something I'll see in my lifetime. But, you know, as my children grow older and my children's children, you know, as the generations go on, the truth will start to emerge. And it is, it is starting. I mean, it's incredible, you know, that so many people are starting to really awaken. But, you know, 10, 20, 50, 100 years from now, you know, hopefully we can break free of the chains of indoctrination and, and really see the world for what it is and, and actually appreciate it and love the world and love each other. And I think if we all understood that there is a creator, people would be less inclined to be so abusive toward each other and the earth. So that's my big message for the people. Just think for yourself at the end of the day, just be a good person. Don't be so quick to just believe something and stand by that belief just because it was taught to you at a young age. Question it, make sure it makes sense. In closing, I'd just like to say that these are my own personal experiences. I never ask anyone to simply just believe everything I'm saying. In fact, please don't. That's how we've gotten into this whole mess to begin with, by blindly following others who say they've already done the research for you. You allow deceptions to occur. Please do your own research and test all things. All space agencies are part of the cover-up because they are also Freemasons. It is my consensus that space is fake. In NASA was set up this deception and even admit that images of Earth are composites and computer-generated images. Since 1958, NASA has literally force-fed us to and continue their trickery, sorcery, wizardry, and being only God of oneself, yet cannot get high enough altitude to provide humanity with one single photo of what the very shape of our world is. I believe strongly in the very senses that God gave all of us. And instinctively, our senses are 99% correct. And my book will help those awakening sheep remove the dark shades from this massive deception. And for those who are unwilling or unable to think past their noses, then those sheep will remain asleep. My book is part of the Great Awakening from pseudoscience that has put man living in a Newtonian world of Einstein physics ruled by Frankenstein logic. Game is over. The consciousness shift of stupidity because of poisonous indoctrination to separate your soul and reality from truth. The knowledge of old type folks. A real awakening is happening all over the world. The curve of the earth, the spinning ball, as well as evolution, dinosaurs, nuclear bombs, and anything, everything else that they teach in the schools that's not founded on scripture. Number one, it's mathematical, geometric, geospatial, geophysical, and in all other respects, the spinning ball earth is a scientific absurdity, provable by observation and measurement and repeatable 
science experiments. The spinning ball Earth does not exist. There is no curve to the Earth. There is no Coriolis. There is no such thing as a spinning ball Earth. And at the end, the Bible, which was a textbook, and I say again, a sci scientific textbook written long before any of the universities that we have today, the Bible says the Earth is flat and stationary. So therefore, we can dispense with all of our science school learning that doesn't agree with the Holy Scripture. The Holy Scripture tells us that the Earth is flat and stationary. All of our measurements and indeed our personal senses tell us that the Earth is not moving. There is no curve to the Earth. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The Holy Scripture tells us the nature of the Earth. The Earth is flat and stationary. Pride, ego, and reputation are three characteristics I see in every spinning ball believer. Let your pride down, knowing you've been heavily deceived your entire life. Let your ego be washed away, knowing it's possible you've been manipulated on such a scale as this. And stop caring what people think about you. I'm not saying be as external and abrasive as some of us. Just realize that yes, we are human and we can be programmed to think certain ways, but also know we can be unplugged and become critical thinkers, observers, and researchers without being told what and how to think. From an education system that runs kindergarten curriculum all the way up to Harvard that was bought over by the Rockefellers a long time ago. This is our time, not theirs. It's time to stand up and start acting instead of relaxing and being told how and what to think from mainstream outlets that are owned by the Bilderberg Foundation, the Triangular Commissions, and the Counselor of Foreign Relations. Think for yourself and stop falling victim of popular public opinion that are owned by these anti-God secret societies. In my in particular gifted opinion, the most precious gift God gave us is free will, but it's up to us to choose what's right and what's wrong what's light and what's dark, what's positive and what's negative, what's yin and yang, what's in motion and stationary, what's flat and what's round, what's good and what's bad. We can't tell you what to do. I can lead you to knowledge, but I can't make you think. It's your choice to take the blue pill and go back to sleep or to take the red pill and stay awake the rest of your life, knowing you are chosen because many are called but few are chosen. And I promise you, once you go flat, you do not go back. They couldn't stop this movement if they tried because truth prevails. Rest in peace, the globe. Every truth have a specific time and moment to manifest itself. Technology being the catalyst for this truth to reemerge and reveal itself again. And proof that it's not a myth, fantasy, or a misunderstanding of our ancestors and all ancient cosmologies. The geography of Earth that is flat and also disguised in words like plains, the Great Plains, the lowlands of Europe, the flatlands, the savannas of Africa, the Amazon basin, salt flats, the mud flats, the depressions, the Arctic tundra, the tablelands of Australia, the steppe of Russia, the grasslands of Argentina, the ice sheets of Antarctica, the wetlands of Florida, and the levels of England. Over these vast plains flows rivers and canals like Nile, Amazon, Mississippi, and countless more, the thousands of miles flowing level in every direction. The oceans and seas that occupy 70% of Earth is flat and level water, but science has no way to prove that it curves or sticks to a spinning ball by a magic force called gravity. The majority of the seabeds of the seas and oceans are abyssal plains. As we say, as above, so below. The longest line of sight of observing Hudson Bay at 1800 miles and my own Himalayan ranges observation on two occasions of plus 2000 miles is just impossible on a globe Earth. No physicist can debunk the testimony presented here by the first category witnesses. 
nor the real geography, nor the longest line of sight, nor the countless researches, investigations, and evidences that prove we live on a flat and stationary plane. The one who needs to prove that it's legit or not is the globe. A mystical, ethereal, celestial sight A divine creation of clockwork of life Designed hit by deceivers and false make-believers Still cowering in shadows, still fearing our light Here we go Never you'll defeat us forever beneath 
breathless, we see through you like air.